Good morning. Uh, on behalf of the Eufro IFSA Joint Tax Force on Forest Education, I would like to thank the organizers of this beautiful, wonderful, all those um, encouraging words uh, for inviting us to present our work here in this session. I also would like to thank you uh, for being here and for our next presenters who are willing to present uh, how their work uh, is related to education. Um, thank you very much for joining us. So you might ask why we need to talk about education if we already know that education is important and we also have, most of us, more of us have our highest degree of education. Why should we talk about education? Um, there are some facts that I think we need to remember about education. First of all, education is a human right that we shall protect. So, however, we have millions of children out of school at this time. Um, even though this awful number that you can see on the projection, in the last three decades, there have been an increasing number of people who have access to education. So we also have a new challenge that is related to technologies. Um, technologies can, be, can help us, but at the same time can hinder. Uh, it's, um, some studies have shown that technology um, had uh, keep uh, some people out of education because they don't have access to technology. But uh, at the same time, as I said, uh, many other people have been able to have education because of technology. So, and those factors are uh, very important for the job market and job markets are constantly evolving and um, education is a key to understand uh, that relationship between the education and how the job markets are evolving. So I just want to mention what uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights mentioned in the Article 20C about about education, it mentions that it shall be free at least at the elementary level. And also encourage nations to uh, have the means for people to get access to technological and professional education. And in a global perspective, education is important to keep the peace among individuals and among the nations. That's the main reason why education is on the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. In addition, there is a strong correlation between levels of education and economic growth, and also, of course, the well-being of the population. I would like to show you some statistics, very, very brief, about the evolution of education. Those statistics are taken from a, a, some uh, studies on our World on Data projects and from the um, World Economic Forum. Here we can see how the literacy rate has increased in the uh, last two centuries. Uh, right now, we have more people who are able to write and read and only, well, only no, 20% of the population is illiterate. So it's a big challenge because it's a large amount of people. Uh, but the good news is that the war is working towards reducing that number. Um, it is expected that by 2050, only five countries will have illiteracy rates about 50 percent, 20 percent, I'm sorry. That is a little bit worse than that. So perhaps we can help those nations to 
have lower levels of illiteracy. Another um, indicator of education is the enrollment in primary education. This graph also show how uh, the elementary enrollments has increased over the years. Uh, there are some nations that don't have data, but there's some others that they have very um, few levels of enrollment in primary school, but they have been progressing and increasing. Here, this is up, up to 2010. We all know that with the Millennium Objectives, uh, most of those countries were able to increase access to primary school, and I believe the if we have a more recent graph for 2015, those could be blue, hopefully. So another indicator, it's about how many years people remain in a school or how many years of education the population has. There is still differences, and we can see the differences in between North and South. But we are making some progress. Uh, again, this is as to, up to 2010. Uh, we're making some progress, and hopefully in a few years we will have more uh, data from those countries that don't have available data to, uh, to monitor how is the uh, progress of our education. Um, again, as I said, the millennium objectives were very efficient on how to access education, especially at the primary school. Now we have a new uh, sustainable development objective on education, and we're hoping to make progress among, among the nations. All this positive data um, about education and the progress in education is, of course, due to the large investment um, at the international, national, even at a local level. There are some trends that still remain, like, for example, the, the developing nations um, still fund or they have an increase in funding for primary um, education, for elementary. Uh, the developing nations have uh, put more attention to educate their people since 1980s, and every year is more and more. And also households play an important role here because more people are able to pay for their own education, especially at the tertiary level. I would like to mention some of the impacts of education. There are, of course, there are more than these three, but just to mention some. The, there is a positive correlation between individuals' education and income. As more higher degree we have, we are pay better, paying being better. There is also a positive correlation between education and the construction of social capital. Uh, this is important nowadays, especially at the climate change um, event that we have. As Dr. Paolo Cerruti mentioned, uh, people with higher education are going to be able to ask, to ask, to ask, which is important. And also, people with higher education are most likely to be employed. What we uh, should expect for the future, as, uh, again, those are just very brief uh, numbers. So since, we are, since the increases in primary education are on the rise, so we also expect po the post-secondary education be uh, demanding. So here, this is uh, from 1970 to 2000, 2100. And right now, we are expecting more people to get access to secondary education. So that means that about 50% of today's young population can be expected to have a tertiary education at least once in their lifetime. And here are some um, numbers on how that education is going to be, or what kind of degrees um, 
people are, want to get bachelor's, master's, short cycle, PhD. Um, also, the expectation is that more people from the developing nations are going to have access to these um, degrees, and also women are going to be more involved and uh, obtain this this type of degrees in the short period, in, uh, in the short future, actually. So this good um, news about education presents some challenges. Um, we need to ask if we are prepared to receive this large number of people at the tertiary education, for example. So we need to know if the job market is recruiting the students that we are preparing, the professionals that we are preparing. We need to know if the institutions are going to uh, have the technology available, the necessary technology available to teach the professors who have new methods of teaching infrastructure, even the educational models, are they, um, are they accomplishing what the job market is looking for? So those are studies that we have to do. So we need to investigate a little bit more on that. And also, are we going to provide quality of education or are we just going to hand degrees for people? So. Those are challenges that we need to address. And how those challenges are going, we are going to take them knowing that we have um, most of the ecosystems uh, at risk, or how are we going to uh, survive to those challenges and, and actually uh, find a way to protect those ecosystems. Those are big, big, questions too. So we can take a look at the labor market, like for example, the employment rates of educated people are higher for women than for men, that's at the general, at the global level. In some countries, educated people don't have jobs. They, um, this data is of course at the general level, but there are differences between countries. And yes, some countries have this because more people are educated, but there are no jobs available. Yesterday, one of the professors talked about innovation, creativity, uh, how the future professionals are going to create their own jobs. Um, here, we can start by uh, thinking about that. Uh, of course, the economic of the countries depends on um, high-skilled workers and also some people who have um, tech, tech skills are uh, on, on demand right now. So um, those are questions very interesting, how the forestry sector are going to address all this. So, um, speaking about technology, so the, this graph shows what are the technologies that the companies are more likely to adopt by 2022. Uh, this is a study from the World Economic Forum. So, you can see that this one is the most important big data analytics. And of course, we have here biotechnology, new materials. Um, uh, those are the technologies on demand. And also, I brought you sort of the demand skills. Like, it is quite interesting to check on those demand skills because there are what we call basic soft skills or competences. Um, the subject specific skills uh, you see are probably this one, system analysis and evaluation, or technology design and programming. The others are soft skills, leadership, social influence, emotional intelligence, 
active learning and learning strategies. Um, those are skills in demand. So here, um, what I want to invite you to do is to think about how the forestry sector and forest education is going to address all these issues related to technologies, access to education, new skills on demand, and accomplish the sustainable development goals. We know that we can have impacts on all of them. Yesterday, for example, we saw uh, how the wood sector can create sustainable communities and buildings that are um, important for the cities. We also have some uh, influence here in the climate actions, life on land, and of course in several countries on um, reducing poverty. So uh, the forestry sector is broad and we can make many things if we will. And I want to present you the work that we have done uh, with the Euphro IFSA Tax Force. This is a project uh, going on from the last three years, almost four years, and it's a collaboration between the UFRO and the International Forest Student Association. At this point, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues who weren't able to be here, Dr. Mika Ricola from Finland, Kali Warhill from Canada, the, he is a, a IFSA member, Ashley Letho, she's also IFSA, uh, Samuel Yuko, he is from IFSA as well, and our previous IFSA uh, members, uh, collaborators, um, Janice Barnes, Magdalena Larker, and Andrew Purret. We have three objectives in this um, new tax force, if you will. Uh, we would like to encourage international discussion on forest and capacity building, of course, to identify the gaps that are in the forest education, highlighting what is the new trends that the forestry sector is going on, and to enhance student mobility and education. To do that, we divide our work in three work packages. One is our research project, on competences, I will talk about that a little bit later. Then we also have a strong collaboration with GFIS, and we have some trainings to students uh, using um, non-traditional teaching methods. Our Global Outlook on Forest Education is our research project. Um, it's, it's been a running since 2015, the first phase, um, nine countries participate. Uh, as you can see, United States, Mexico, Colombia, South Africa, Austria, um, Sweden, Finland, Iran, and China. Um, we already have results from those studies. I will also show some of the results later on. And in the second phase, we involve three more countries, um, Chile, Argentina, Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon. Where, where we did in the first uh, phase, and we are doing now in the second phase, is we uh, interview, we select a group of uh, graduates from the countries and we interviewed them using the behavioral event interview, um, known as VEI. Uh, that is a, an interview that asks uh, graduates to mention three events of failure and three events of success in their professional lives. Um, so with that, we are able to understand how the graduates, uh, where did I, they acquire their competences and how they are using or not using it in their working lives. So here, for example, uh, I'm showing you that this leadership and management was mentioned in nine of the countries as a failure. Nine out of nine in all of them. 
and they were also mentioned as success. What happened is that sometimes something that it is mentioned as a failure, when they realize they can improve that skill, they act, uh, immediately improve their skill. Um, this is only an example of what we found. There is a report that is already written and is in our website. You're very welcome to take a look at it, or I can make more, um, provide more information after this presentation if you want. So, in general, what we found in these nine countries is that most of the competences missing are soft competences. And if you remember, I just briefly mentioned that those competences are on demand. So just for you to know. But the good, the good news about is that also the um, specific competence, subject specific competences, such as silviculture, dendrology, inventories, web technology, and also um, subjects that we learn when we are forestry students, they are mentioned as uh, in the success events. We also went ahead and reviewed the curriculums for the uh, countries and the universities that were under our study, and to compare among the competences, what competences are included in the curricula. Here, uh, the, again, the generic, the, we call the generic soft competences or basic competences are, are the same. So those are not included in the curricula, like teamwork skills, leadership and management, communication internships, communica communication interdisciplinary actions. So we are doing very good as a forestry technicals, if you will, technicians, but we are lacking these competences that are now on demand. Our second uh, working package is the work with uh, GFIS. We were able to launch 900 forestry programs in the, these three levels, uh, bachelor's, master in science, and PhD, um, for over 400 institutions worldwide. We also compile um, online courses about forestry and forestry-related topics, short courses and trainings, external news, research blogs, scholarships and mobility opportunities, open access to publication and thesis. What we want is to compile all the forestry information in one uh, platform. So now we have um, education session within the GFIS. You're also welcome to review the website, GFIS website, and to find all the material related to education under our education page. Uh, and also, if you want to upload some material that you think it is important for the students to know, please let us know. We will welcome to find a way to, to put that material on the website. We also have had some trainings using, as I mentioned, no traditional teaching methods in different events, um, IFSA events and also UFRO events, like seminars, uh, symposiums, and also in the general meeting, UFRO, uh, IFSA general meetings and regional IFSA meetings as well. We have been in Ghana, uh, Argentina, Moldova, Colombia, Mexico, Germany, uh, wow, several places. And we are planning to be also in Curitiba and um, the courses we have been teaching are uh, subjects that are underrepresented in the curricula, like forest governance, a forest entrepreneurship, human and wildlife conflict, um, writing uh, papers, uh, writing styles, um, and I forgot the other one, again, uh, sorry. So 
uh, that we, we've been able to uh, meet different uh, students from all over the world and uh, provide them some courses and trainings. And also to celebrate the year International Day of Forest uh, this year, the theme is on education. So we create a competition on the best practices in forest education. We are so pleased that we received 71 applications. It was a really, really tough de decision to pick only two winners. But what we want is to encourage um, professors, think, encourage professors to keep doing, keep teaching forestry in all the levels of education. We receive applications for primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Those are very good news. We, the winners, uh, we announced the winners just two days ago, and we, we were very pleased with the results of this competition. And what will be the future of the tax force? Of course, we want to finish our research on competences in the six countries that we have and to uh, uh, publish our paper. Uh, we also want to continue to encourage professors to do some research on education, to share with us your teaching methods and to try to change your teaching methods as well, because the students are requesting that. We also are going to have some research on green jobs. It's a collaboration with UFRO, the European Forest Institution, and the Joint Tax Force. And also, we, will, we would like to continue students' mobility and education opportunity as the trainings, as I mentioned. Um, this is my final slide. So here is our information. We have a blog, we have Facebook, Twitter, uh, and of course the uh, UFRO website. website. All our, our information is there. And of course, I'll, I'll be here if you have questions. Please let me know. Thank you.